Welcome, birders. This is Ed Pullen, your host on the Bird Banner Podcast, where birders talk birding. You may have noticed on most of my episodes, I talk with my guest about how they got started in birding. You know, their birding beginnings, people, experiences, places, birds that were influential, and them uh, coming over to the birding world, becoming birders, becoming passionate about birding, and uh, how their birding careers developed. I think that's been really fun for me, and I think fun for my listeners to hear that. Today, I don't have a guest. I'm going to do a solo podcast, and I'm going to tell a little bit about my birding story, but I'm also going to talk a lot about birding resources, resources of all sorts. And I think this will be interesting for beginning birders, but I think it'll be also, I hope it'll also be interesting for more experienced birders and birders who've been birding for a while, uh, because oftentimes we get asked questions about what do you do for this? How do you find that? All sorts of questions about birding. And maybe some of my ideas about those will be things that other birders can use when they're talking to people about getting into birding. So we'll find out about that. I started birding as an adult. On many of my guests started when they were little kids, and that's a terrific advantage, getting a start when you're young. Uh, but uh, it's not the way a lot of us got started. A lot of us started birding as an adult. One of my guests, Ann Nightingale, from British Columbia, from Victoria, became a fabulous birder and didn't start until well into her adulthood. I was just boggled at how passionate and incredibly competent, proficient birder she became without getting an early start. So it's definitely possible. It's even more possible these days than maybe it was in times gone by when you didn't have as many resources. But anyway, I got into birding when my wife and I were traveling from Key West, Florida, up to visit my family, my mom and dad in Hudson, Florida. We had an extra day and Kay said, can we go to the Everglades? And I, I said, oh gosh, no, we've already seen alligators. What's in the Everglades? And she said, well, you know, I'm a bird watcher. I said, you're a bird watcher? We've been seeing each other, I think I think we were married by then. Anyway, yeah, we were definitely married by then. And uh, I didn't even know she was a birder because she's she had this perfect balance in her life in birding. She'd be passionate about birding at times and not so much at other times. But anyway, she had binos and a bird book in her suitcase. I didn't even know about this. Uh, so we went to the Everglades and uh, I just fell head over heels in love with birding in one day. Uh, we saw everything it seemed like. she just gave me immense grief that I wasn't looking at any any birds under 12 inches tall. Pileated woodpecker was maybe the first bird we saw that day. We saw purple gallinule and all the long-legged waders and bald eagle and swallowtailed kite and just these incredible, beautiful birds of the Everglades on a beautiful summer day. Uh, it was just fabulous. And I went home and, and started studying like crazy. But I started pretty much in a bubble. You know, Kay was my uh, mentor. She had, she had gotten her start in birding when she was uh, a lumberjack on a, a brush crew uh, in Boise, Idaho, living with three Southern California birders. And they were birding all the time. And she got into birding while she was them and with them. And, and they, they taught her a way to identify birds and a way to keep your records. Uh, and the way she kept her records, and the way I did for several years, was I had a bird guide, and when I'd see a new bird for the first time, I would make notes in the column. So when I saw my first American robin, I circled American robin. Uh, I went over to the my Peterson guide and the pictures on the side, and I pointed at what I saw, made little notes, I wrote the date and the county I saw the bird in, whether it was a male or a female, uh, and uh, and that was my bird list for a long time. Uh, but it was Kay teaching me how to bird and me reading field guides. That was kind of how I got my start in birding. My first field guide was the first Peterson guide uh, that had the pictures on the same you know, on the opposite page, the plates were opposite the text. The old ones had all the plates in the middle and were, I thought, more difficult to use. But this was a beautiful uh, field guide. I was just happy as a clam. I also had a golden guide that I used. Uh, and between those, those were my uh, resources for birding. I had a cheap pair of Bushnell 735s and was off and at it. Uh, so I studied and studied those resources. I tried to memorize the bird guides and 
list as many birds as I could, and Kay wouldn't let me have a bird until I knew I knew that bird. I had to read everything about it in the field guide. I had to know the, the primary and secondary field marks. I had to know how big it was and what its range was and if it migrated, where it went to, and all the things I could learn from the field guides uh, about that bird. That was before the internet uh, and before I really realized that there are a lot of bird watchers out there, a lot of birders all over and birding resources. I wasn't a member of an Audubon Society, didn't really know any other birders and uh, studied on my own. And I did that for probably two or two and a half years while I lived in, at West Point in New York. And then Kay and I traveled across the country. We came across and birded all the way. So we had so we joked that we had some great breastfeeding stops. We had a five-month-old baby. Jean, my daughter, was five months. And our plan for the trip across the country was to drive about two or two and a half hours until Jean would be hungry and we'd stop. We'd set up a lawn chair and Kay would feed the baby and I'd walk around and bird a little bit. And uh, it was a nice place. We might stay for a while. If it wasn't, we'd move on. And so I got some great, I built up a pretty nice list. I probably had maybe 150 lifebirds by the time I got uh, across the across the country, maybe 200. I don't know. Anyway, I had a nice list I was working on and got here and promptly I said, I need to find some birders out here. I was working a lot and starting a medical practice and really wanted to get into birding. So I joined the Audubon Society, and that was a change, a life changer. I started going on some field trips with them. Thais Bach was one of the field trip leaders that I was so impressed with. Met uh, Patrick Sullivan. Patrick was a, a young birder. I think he was maybe 11 or 12 at the time. And, oh, he was incredibly talented and just sharp as a tack, finding birds all over the place and pointing things out that went on a field trip I didn't even see. He'd hear it and point it out, and I'd see it, and it was just really cool. Uh, and then I decided to take uh, the intermediate birding class through the Audubon Society. I was a little worried about that because I knew I wasn't an intermediate birder. I was definitely a beginner. But I, I called up the leader, Ken Brown. He said, oh, yeah, join the class. You'll do fine. And Ken and I hit it off as good friends. Kate took the class with me. In that first class, Ken's wife, Rachel, took was taking the class also. Uh, so Ken saw Kay and I, and he said, oh, yeah, Kay was an artist, and Rachel's very creative and an artist too. And I, he could tell I was pretty much passionate about birding. And he said, "Oh my goodness, this could be friends. I could get Rachel into birding." So Ken grabbed us, and we rode. Kay and I rode with Ken and Rachel on all the field trips, and I became close friends with Ken. And uh, I had a resource, a mentor. Having a mentor is has to be up there with the best things a beginning birder can do is have somebody to uh, lean on, to teach them the ropes, to get them out birding, show them the places, show them the birds, uh, help them through their identification struggles. And Ken taught a fabulous class too, which was just in incredibly helpful. Uh, and along the way, I got a few other resources. But before I get into resources that aren't people. I want to talk about human resources. There's probably nothing a beginning birder can do that will be more of a positive influence and help them more than finding birders to go birding with. Your local Audubon Society almost certainly has field trips that you can join. They're usually free. If not, they're inexpensive. Uh, and going on field trips with other birders and learning from them and learning the tricks of the trade from people who are more experienced. The field trip leaders are generally quite competent uh, and uh, want to be helpful. They're there to help you find the birds. It's just, it's, uh, it's, there's nothing better than having uh, good, strong birders to go birding with when you're getting started. I strongly recommend as the primary thing any beginning birder do is to find other birders to go birding with. It's just incredibly helpful. As I said, your local Audubon Society is almost certainly a great resource. If there's a birding club in your community, join it. Uh, they usually have field trips. Uh, in our state, we have WAS, the Washington Ornithological Society. They have meetings. They have field trips. Uh, wherever you live, there's a good chance you'll be able to find other birders if you look in the right places. Uh, so I strongly, strongly recommend any beginning birder take advantage of the human capital in your community. Find the other birders and get them to go birding with you or go birding with them because that is the fastest and best way to get a start. Two of the books I bought as resources early on were the three-volume Audubon Society Master Guide to Birding, and I thought I had... Oh, what a resource it was. It had the life history and nice uh, several-page 
several pages on each species. It was a good resource. It was dated even at the time. Uh, it's really dated now. But it, it remains a pretty good resource if you just want to find out natural history and, and field identification things about all of the, the common species in North America. The other book I bought was Ken Kaufman's Advanced Birding Guidebook. It was the, the volume one of that, uh, the first edition, was terrific. It talked about some of the real challenges, and, and, and I didn't even know these were. He talked about a, spar uh, a generic approach to sparrows. He talked about Empidonax flycatchers. He talked about uh, the finches, you know, Cassin's finch and purple finch and house finch. Uh, talked about the Spazella sparrows. A lot of things that I, uh, well above my uh, my pay grade in birding at the time, but I learned a lot from reading those and learned an approach to, to trying to study birds. That was really good. Uh, but the world has changed. Uh, I've been a birder since then, have joined a birding club, have made lots of friends, uh, and uh, have become uh, pretty adept at finding things online. But things have changed a lot since then. Uh, now, uh, finding resources for birding is not so much about owning books, but really about knowing what online resources are available and what people to, people you can uh, connect with, both online and in person. That said, field guides, paper, print field guides, I think remain really a helpful resource for any beginning birder. Uh, having something you put in your hands and flip through and compare pages as opposed to uh, flipping around a phone app or zooming around the internet uh, trying to compare pictures uh, is really helpful. Field guides also have the advantage, at least most of the field guides, of not using photographs. Photographs are terrific at uh, uh, studying birds. Uh, but no one photograph can really show you all the key field marks of a species, whereas the really good artistic uh, paintings, plates that are made uh, for the good field guides are better at that, better to look at the stereotypical bird and, and be able to use those field marks that are pointed out, uh, maybe even exaggerated a little bit in the color plates, uh, rather than trying to find them on photographs. Then looking at photographs afterwards to see what they really look like, uh, that's helpful. But having, having a field guide uh, with uh, plates and paintings of the birds, I think, is, is optimal. So that said, there are just a pile of field guides out there these days. Uh, I think many people, at least I think, and I think a lot of other people, think that the Sibley Guide to the Birds of North America is the premier uh, field guide. The big problem with the Sibley Guide, and Sibley has two types of guide. They have what I call Big Sibley and Little Sibley. Big Sibley is the guide to all of the birds of North America. The second edition of the Sibley Guide has almost all the birds uh, of North America and has beautiful color plates and does a terrific job of showing them. But it's a pretty good sized book. It's really too small to fit in a pocket. It's really not designed to carry into the field, uh, which is just fine now because we have other ways to have a field guide. We have it on our phone in our pocket these days, and I'll get to that later. But Sibley has some real advantages. It has uh, nice photographs of birds in flight and pointing out their flight patterns and what they look like in flight. It has mostly, it has both the male and female and juvenile plumage and any other confusing plumages that there are and does a, just a nice job of pointing those without a whole lot of text. One of the drawbacks of Sibley is that it doesn't have long written descriptions that go into a lot of detail. Uh, National Geographic is the other, in my opinion, really top field guide for the birds of North America. The National Geographic Guide, I think, is in the eighth edition now. comes out with a new edition every couple of years. Uh, but any of the last two or three editions are probably just fine for, for general purposes. And it is it excels in its written description. It's a really detailed, you know, two or three paragraph written description of all the things you need to know to identify the bird, but, uh, frequency patterns, vagrancy patterns, has nice color plates, does a good job with that too. So I think having those two field guides gives you pretty good detailed uh, reference for bird identification in North America. There are a bunch of others out there. Kaufman has a terrific guide. Uh, it has beautiful photographs. Uh, and uh, does a nice job, and it's concise uh, and eloquent, and does a really good job too. But I think, for me, the photographs just aren't quite as good uh, as 
uh, a nice color plate uh, painting of, of the birds. So I prefer the other two, but that's another good choice. The Golden Guide is inexpensive, easy to use. And now Audubon is coming out with state guides that are really good for the casual birder or really beginning birder. Uh, if you get the guide, just the, the three or 400 most common birds in your state, that narrows it down from the 850 or 900 birds in the other uh, national field guides and can be pretty helpful for beginning birder. Uh, I know that when I talked to Dennis Paulson on an episode recently, he is in the process of making uh, a Audubon Guide to the Birds of Washington. Uh, I talked to David Irons, who just recently published the one for Oregon, and they're coming out in many states now. So keep your eye open for those uh, as maybe a, a good uh, birthday or Christmas gift for a beginning uh, birder who might not might not want to know about all the birds in the country, but might really want to know about the ones in their city park or in their own state. So that's another good resource. For the birder who's maybe beyond uh, the basic information in a field guide, there are innumerable print resources for specific groups of birds. And I'm not going to try to go into all of those groups of birds. I just want to give a shout out to two or three that I think are just terrific resources. Number one uh, is one of my favorite books, Pete Dunn's Field Guide Companion. It's an old book. Uh, you can still find it on Amazon. Maybe you have to buy it used, but it's a terrific resource. It has uh, a, about a page uh, written on each common breeding species in the United States, and it goes, it, it's just terrific. It, it lists what its habitat is. It gives it a nickname. Examples. It calls the brown creeper the legless perpetual motion bark wren. And it calls yellow-threaded warbler. He calls it the treetop black and white warbler. Gives you a, a different way. Say, so, yeah, okay, that's a different way to think about that bird. It gives an idea of birds you might find with it. And it goes into just a nice written description of what how the bird looks like in flight, its behavior, its habitat, and just helps round out your basic information about any specific species. So, Plus, Pete Dunn is such a good writer. I mean, he, he's done all sorts of uh, storybooks and uh, collections of essays that are terrific fun reading, but he is a good writer. And when he, you know, is reading his writing, it's just fun to read, even if you're not trying to learn. So that's a really good resource. And then there are two uh, group-specific resources I want to give a shout out to. Uh, another one by Dunn is uh, Hawks in Flight. Uh, Hawks in Flight is in the second edition. The first edition really was terrific. It changed the way I thought about trying to identify uh, raptors in flight. But the second edition is a thing of beauty. It has a lot more color plates, but it re retains the black and white drawings uh, that really are helpful at identifying distant birds. When you go to a hawk watch site or looking at a hawk far away in the air, it's not like you you see whether it has uh, you know the specific details of plumage. You're really looking for its shape, its behavior, its size, where the black and where the white is, those type of things. So the little color, the little sketches are really helpful. The descriptions are really fun. And his, again, the writing, it's by three authors, uh, Pete Dunn, David Sibley, uh, and Clay Sutton. The written descriptions are just fabulous. I'm going to read the description, just a little half a paragraph about two different falcons. First, the Merlin. The start of the sections reads, The Merlin is to an American kestrel what a Harley-Davidson motorcycle is to a bicycle. Superficially, the two are similar. Both are small North American falcons that both perch hunt and hunt on the wing and take a variety of prey. Given time for study, a Merlin might appear slightly larger, but except for the larger female Merlins, not dramatically so. When a Merlin takes flight, however, all similarities evaporate. In the air, the difference between a Merlin and an American kestrel is not a matter of degree, it is quantum. I just love that description. You can tell I like falcons. Who doesn't like falcons? And then jeer falcon. This is the first paragraph in the jeer falcon description. Here's a falcon that combines the size of a red-tailed hawk with the flight prowess of a Merlin, then adds an element beyond the measure of both the largest of the falcons, and a true arctic falcon. Geofalcon adults are presumed to remain on or close to the breeding territory in, an, in the Arctic as winter closes in over the land. In winter, as in summer, rock and willow ptarmigan are the dietary mainstays, although geofalcons are capable of taking almost any size avian prey. I just love those descriptions. And every, every uh, species in the book has beautiful written description and tremendous detail on field identification. So it's a must read for hawk watchers. 
The second group of birds that I have a book that I really recommend is shorebirds. Shorebirds can be tough to identify. You know, they they tend to be shades of gray and brown. They tend to look sort of alike. Uh, they fly in groups and sometimes mix together. And I think can be hard, especially for beginning birder to identify. But Dennis Paulson in his, his book, uh, Shorebirds of the Pacific Northwest, breaks through all of that. He just gives tremendous detail in such a beautifully written and fun to read way that it's a book that even if you're not from the Pacific Northwest, it is worth uh, worth getting and reading. Uh, he is a skilled writer who ha combines exquisite detail with just evocative prose and in a way that makes it so much fun to, to read that you forget you're trying to study and sometimes you just want to read it for fun. I'm just going to mention a few of the other tons of books. And if you're a birder or a passionate birder, you probably have a library overflowing with these books that don't get read enough. But there are a few that I really uh, want to give a shout out to. Uh, Stephen N.G. Howell has written a number of books. And I love his book on molt and, and the really new Oceanic Birds of the World, The Photo Guide by Howell and Zufelt is just a beautiful book to look at and read. I, I love that book. Uh, I'm not going to mentioned too many more. There are just way too many to, to talk about. Uh, the These days, though, uh, most of the birding resources that I use and that other birders use are online. It seems like the obvious place to start is eBird. In North America, most birders use eBird. Almost all birders use eBird as a resource to look at and find out what's being seen, but most of us also contribute to eBird. It's so easy to do. It's kind of revolutionized the listing game uh, and record keeping uh, process for most North American birders. And it really is useful all over the world as catching on in, in other parts of the world also. But eBird is owned and managed by Cornell University. And it is a free resource that all of us contribute to as our contribution to citizen science. And in return, get a fabulous listing program that we can keep our bird records at. So over the years, I, I told you earlier, I started keeping my records written in the, in the uh, side columns of my birding guide. Uh, I, from there on, I went to using a Mac-based uh, app and then Avisys, a PC-based app when I had to change from a Mac to a PC for work. Uh, but then eBird came in 2009, and I've been using that since then and it has just revolutionized record keeping for me. Uh, it started out a little bit tedious because you'd have to go to the field, keep notes, and then when you got home you had to enter where you, where you went and what you saw, which was a lot like it was before eBird, but before long a second party came out with a phone app uh, that you could use to, that you bought, and could use to enter your sightings in the field and they would just upload to eBird automatically. eBird before long saw that everyone wanted to use that and merged with that app, or acquired that app, has improved it in many ways since then. So birders now, when we go to the field, the resource we use to keep track of our records is usually eBird. You simply open the app in your phone, push the start button, uh, I'm not going to try to describe how to use it, but you enter your sightings either as you see them or before you, right when you're finished birding at a certain location write down how many species you saw of each how many numbers you saw of each species it's quick and easy takes a couple of minutes and your record keeping is done uh, the other super cool thing about eBird is that you can look and see what everyone else is seeing too all this information is public so if you see a lesser uh, yellow legs at Levy Pond in Fife near where I live, and you submit that to eBird, anyone who subscribes to uh, either the Needs or the Rare Bird Alert, and those are alerts you can subscribe to for on, on eBird, you can get an email every time a bird is seen uh, in a county that you haven't seen this year or ever seen or in a state or in the whole ABA area or whatever you want. Uh, you can get an email telling you where and when it was seen. You can also subscribe to the Rare Bird Alerts for any given area, any county or state or major region, so that you get an email uh, every day or every hour, whichever you prefer, uh, of all of the birds that are not common in a particular area. So it is just a tremendous resource to use. There's all sorts of other ways to use uh, eBird data to decide where to go birding, where to look for certain species. It's just a terrific resource. It's just revolutionized uh, North American bird record keeping. Uh, and in addition, 
is a research tool that people can use. So it's a terrific resource, and pretty much not all of us, but the vast majority of birders in North America use eBird as a record-keeping tool and a tool to find and look for birds. But in terms of bird identification resources, another resource through Cornell University is Birds of the World. Until recently, it was Birds of North America. Now it's expanded to be Birds of the World. And for a modest subscription fee, I think it's 5 or $6 a month, uh, you have access to Birds of the World. And it is a fabulous resource, especially great for Birds of North America, but getting good for other places too. Uh, if you want to find literally anything about the life history or field identification of any species, all you do is go to your account in Birds of, no Birds of the World, you type in the species, it brings up a long monograph of that bird. Uh, it talks about their life history, their migratory patterns, their molt, any field identification information you want. talks about how many eggs they lay, what they make their nest out of, what they eat, what research uh, is still needs to be done in that species, and literally anything you want to find out about, about that bird. There's a really good chance you'll find it in the, in the monograph on that species in Birds of the World. It's, for me, tremendous resource. I try to use it when I see a bird I haven't seen in a long time or any new life species that I find. I try to read the monograph. It probably takes an hour to read the monograph, but it's just, for me, it just cements in my mind, uh, boy, now I really feel like I know that bird. It's just a tremendous resource. Uh, other online resources, though, are mostly free. Uh, there are a lot of good blogs on, there are a lot of good podcasts, certainly you're listening to one now, uh, but there are a lot of good podcasts and blogs that can just be informational and fun, uh, but online uh, bird finding resources are really helpful. Not so much bird identification, there are some bird identification ones too, like uh, North American Gulls uh, is a Facebook uh, group where you can post pictures of gulls you have questions about. There's a What's This Bird Facebook group that you can post pictures to. Uh, there are Twitter feeds and Instagram things and all sorts of online things. Uh, but uh, the, the bulletin boards, I think, remain really key for a lot of people. Almost every state has at least one, and a lot of states have regional uh, online listservs. By listserv, I mean uh, if you find an unusual sighting or have a question about a bird or whatever, you can send an email to this listserv and it will be posted there. And anyone who subscribes to that listserv will get a copy of that email or a digest of that email if you prefer not to get all individual emails. Uh, and so here in Washington, we have Tweeters run by the University of Washington, and it is a tremendous resource. Uh, it's, it is a place for uh, unusual sightings to be posted primarily, but also a, a place for questions to be asked, uh, requests for information, uh, trading, trading uh, interesting stories or information. It's kind of like a community and is a tremendous resource. Uh, the American Birding Association has a resource on their webpage that you can go to that lists all of the North American uh, birding listservs. Uh, so that's really, really a tremendous resource. Facebook groups that I want to give a shout out to are the ABA's Rare Bird Alert Facebook uh, uh, group, uh, and there are just all, I'm not even going to try to go into how many Facebook choices there are. On Twitter, I like to follow uh, hashtag bird Twitter. Uh, it just has, you know, if you go to that every couple of days, this has, you know, 10 or 15% of the tweets on that are, you know, interesting. You'll leave up that photograph that's interesting or a question. Uh, so I, I like following that. Uh, but uh, those are just a few of the resources. But I wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair to not emphasize the relational and interpersonal aspects of birding. If there's one resource you can develop uh, as a, a birder, either an experienced birder or a beginning birder, is to have good birding buddies. Uh, I have to say I'm blessed with some really good birding friends here in Washington and some around the country. And when I go back to visit my family in Maine, I met Don Mayers. Don is just a, such a fabulous guy, and what a resource. He's in his 80s now, but he just is the most gracious and 
fabulous friend to have when I go back. He takes me out birding. We see stuff and just shows me around. It's terrific to have friends to go birding with. I have Ken Brown and Bruce Labar and a whole bunch of other people from my ABC Birding Club and others here in Washington uh, that I get out with and learn from. Uh, is uh, bird, you don't need to bird in a vacuum, develop relationships, find friends, uh, get out there, go birding, and have fun. Before I wrap up, I just want to mention a couple of other things. First, the Merlin Bird app. For phone apps, the Merlin Bird app might be one of the best things a beginning birder or a birder traveling to an area where they don't know the birds can use. Cornell University, again, puts out a free phone app for both iPhone and Android phones uh, that uh, allows you to go through a simple process to give you a few limited choices of potential birds you might be seeing. You simply enter where you're at, the color, size, appearance, habitat, behavior, a few things that you would notice about any bird you're looking at, and the app will automatically give you sometimes one or two, sometimes a half a dozen choices of birds you might be seeing. And very, very often, I'm not sure what percent, but I think over 90% of the time, the bird you're looking at will be right there and you can pick it out. I've found this to be extremely helpful when I'm traveling. If I'm traveling and don't have a bird guide and I get a pretty good look at a bird, but I really don't know what the heck I'm seeing. Uh, when you travel, you can sometimes see birds that are in whole families of birds you've never seen before, are not familiar with at all, and you even if you studied ahead, there are uh, dozens if not hundreds of species you've tried to memorize but never seen, and so it's really a challenge. And this Merlin Bird app is just extremely accurate and helpful. So I recommend to any beginner, just download the free Merlin Bird app, just the name of the, the falcon, Merlin. Uh, if you put in your search in your app store, Merlin, it will come right to it. Uh, download that app, and it will really be helpful. It's just totally uber cool. Can't even get over how cool it is. While I'm talking about smartphone apps, it would be remiss in any discussion of birding resources not to talk about field guides that are apps on your phone these days. Most of us, when we go to the field birding these days, don't carry a paper field guide with us. We have a smartphone app that replaces the field guide. It's really nice because when you go birding, there's a lot of stuff to lug around. You've got your binoculars, you've got water, you've got maybe a spotting scope on a tripod, you've maybe got a camera, uh, maybe some food to lug along or whatever you've got with you. And carrying a big book along with you is just a hassle. And these days, the phone apps are so good that you really don't need a, a print field guide along with you in the field. In North America, we have a number of excellent choices of apps. I use two. I use the Sibley guide as my primary resource. It's just a terrific app. Sibley, uh, in his uh, brilliance of artistry, has just developed a terrific phone app for field identification of North American birds that is really as good as any other, if not the best. It's not terribly expensive. I think it's about 20 bucks to buy online. And you download it from wherever you get your apps from. And it's on your smartphone. And it's just fabulous. Uh, it has all, all of, almost all of the information that's in the, in the written field guide. And it's at your fingertips. You can compare two species on it. Just lots of ways to use it. And I, I find it uh, just uh, indis indispensable. It has a terrific added feature that has the actual recorded bird songs on it. The bird book gives you a written description of the song. The phone app gives you the actual recordings of most of the songs and common calls of almost all the species in the field guide. And it's just a terrific resource. I strongly recommend it. The other uh, phone app that I use is I iBird Pro. Uh, it is It came out before Sibley. Uh, it's still a terrific resource. And it has some features that are a little a nice adjunct. It has a few species that aren't in the Sibley app, especially recordings. It does have a few more recordings in it than the Sibley app does. Uh, so if you hear a song and it doesn't really match any of the ones in the Sibley app, try the try the iBird Pro app. Uh, it's pretty darn good. Uh, so between the two of them, I feel like I have all the uh, all bird identification tips that I need in my pocket. And since I'm carrying my phone to eBird with anyway, it's nothing extra to carry. I just got to worry about your battery life. <laughs> just joking. Anyway, uh, that that's a really cool resource. So phone apps are where it's at in terms of a, a carry to the field field guide these days. The other thing I want to mention are bird finding guides. I talked mostly about bird identification guides before, but there are bird finding guides for wherever you want to go 
really in the world, certainly in North America. Uh, essentially, every state in the country has at least one, if not more, uh, birding guide. The ABA publishes a whole series of these. There are other uh, other companies that publish them. The ABA series, the Lane Guides, and some of the other ABA publications are quite good, and you really won't go wrong by uh, acquiring one of these field, uh, one of these bird finding guides, and using it when you travel to an area. Our state has one put out by the Washington Ornithological Society, uh, and it's extremely thought a guide to bird finding in Washington. It's just extremely helpful. I use it all the time planning local trips to areas I might not be so familiar with. Uh, so bird finding guides are really helpful. And I want to put a shout out to an old book that I just have found so much fun over the years. It's the ABA Bird Finding Guide, Bird Finder, A Guide to Planning North American Trips by Jerry Cooper. It was published in 1995, but you can still buy it online. And it is a, a book for dreamers. Uh, over the years, for many years, I was working a lot and didn't have a lot of time to go on trips. Or, you know, it's hard, it's hard to plan a trip to a place you haven't been to before. Uh, but, or decide where to go. Where do you, there's all these places you've got four days or six days and a certain time of year. Where the heck are you going to go find the best place to go birding? Well, Jerry Cooper wrote this book uh, as a guide to finding a way to see 650 species in North America in one year on a limited budget. Uh, and so he has uh, a number of trips uh, planned through the course of the year. So if in January, you do this. In February, you do that. In April, you do this. In July, you do that. In December, you do this. And you don't have to go at exactly the times he mentions, but they're good general, uh, general uh, suggestions of places to go. And they are just the, literally the premier birding field trips in North America are outlined in this trip and their detailed descriptions. You know, go to the street, turn left, go half a mile, or maps uh, gives you a, a list of birds that you want to really try to see there if you want a big list in a given year, birds you're likely to see there, birds you might see there, and uh, just gives you places to stay, hotline numbers to call. A lot of these are a little out of date, but the field trip directions are generally still pretty much right on. And sometimes it's just fun to dream. You know, yeah, I think, God, what would I do in if I had some time in February, looking at the January, February, March time frame, and it's Oklahoma. Who would think of going and birding in Oklahoma? But he outlines a field trip to Oklahoma that's, wow, long spurs and all these things. You say, wow, that would be really cool. And so I just love that book. So I really recommend it to anyone who's a dreamer, who just wants to have a, a, a book that they can read about potential trips they can take. It's just so much fun to have on hand. So that got me through a lot of years of hard work and trips that I'd like to take. And there are still a handful of trips in that book that I haven't been on, and they're on my to-do list. So I recommend A Birder's Guide to Planning North American Field Trips by Jerry Cooper. Well, that wraps up the Bird Bander podcast number 71, Ed Pullen talking about birding resources and ways to become a better birder. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have comments, please leave them. You can leave them wherever as a part of a review, wherever you get your podcast feed, or you can go to birdbanner.com because I leave a blog post for every episode. And on the blog post for this episode will be essentially all the resources that I mentioned during the episode. Links to them if they're online, uh, pictures of them if they're a book, that sort of thing. Uh, so you don't have to make notes. You can always go to the blog post associated with any episode to find those sorts of details. I think that's really helpful, and I hope you enjoy that. So, until next time, good birding. Good day. <laughs>